How's it going today, guys? Good. That was weak. Come on. How are we doing today? Good. Much better, much better. All right, so my name is Parker, and I'm an environmentalist and a naturalist, as you guys just heard. Ever since I've been a little kid, I've been obsessed with animals. Do we have any animal lovers in the crowd? Got a lot of animal lovers. Yeah, uh, if you take me to an aquarium or a zoo, I can usually name you off a couple facts about any random animal that's in front of us, off the top of my head. It's pretty crazy. I've always had books on animals that I've read ever since I was little, little. And here's me with a goat. Because the break was not down I love all different kinds of animals. Big, small, hairy, oh my gosh. bald, okay. um, domesticated, non-domesticated, universally loved, or vastly misunderstood. Oh, yes, we are. There we go. Okay. And there's me with a horse when I was little. Then we got me with an alligator, my little sister. I know I'm a regular crocodile hunter, aren't I? One animal that I really love a lot about is the honeybee. I know a ton about this animal, and we're going to talk about them a little bit later. Uh, I went to Humboldt State University, um, where I learned a lot about the environment. I learned a lot about environmental impacts. Environmental impacts are happening everywhere. They're happening right here in Sacramento, West Sacramento today. Um, I, learned, I took many classes. I took classes on biology. I took classes on zoology, herpetology, botany. The list goes on and on. Native American studies. I tried to fill my head with whatever I could about the environment. I'm a big traveler. I would travel around to a ton of different places, and I started to begin to notice the environmental impacts that were happening all over the place. Then I started work. I started working in Moab, Utah. I saw a ton of environmental impacts there, but the biggest environmental impacts I saw were when I went to Redding, California, Whiskey Town. Anybody ever been to Redding, Whiskey Town before? A couple of you? Okay, it's near Shasta. Any Shasta fans? Anyway, what I noticed when I got there was there was a beautiful forest where I was working. It's an amazing place, it's really awesome. But I also noticed there was a huge layer of what is known as duff covering the forest floor. If you don't know what duff is, duff is a buildup of things that plants drop. So whether it's leaves, needles, sticks, branches, and over time, that duff builds up if there's not something that happened. That something that happens is fire. This forest I was working in needed fire to thrive, needed fire to be healthy. This area I was working in had not burned in a very, very, very long time. And you could see it when you hiked around. You'd see trees that were bent over. They had branches hanging off and all this stuff. Um, it just wasn't as healthy as it could be. And that's because of something called fire suppression, which I learned a lot about while I was there. Um, fires get suppressed in areas. People don't like fire, right? Do we like fire? Does anybody like fire in here? Besides like campfires and fireworks and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. So... Fires need to happen in certain areas for them to be healthy. And if they don't happen every so often, you have a forest that's not healthy. Um, Whiskey Town had not burned in some, like a very long time. Uh, it was basically just lying tinder. We had a very, very hot summer, and I was working up there, and a car was parked on the side of the road on the 299 highway, and it sparked. And we may all know about the car fire in here. There are some other devastating fires that have been happening in California all over the place. Um, that place took up, like took off in flames like you've never seen before. Uh, it burned all of around where I was working. It burned Shasta and parts of Redding and actually got into the city. It was pretty devastating. And it affected a lot of people's lives. I started realizing... Um, there's environmental impacts happening, and this one hit really close to home. And then I started thinking even more about what was going to happen to that ecosystem after the fire happened. Um, it's a barren wasteland right now. I went back to visit after. It's rough to see it. Places where I've hiked, swam, they're not there anymore. And one of my favorite places was this meadow that had these flowers that grew all over the place. And I could see my favorite honeybees that were pollinating flowers out there. And unfortunately, I don't think they're going to be back there for a long, long time. And then I started thinking, now the bees have one more thing that they have to deal with. Oops, clicked it too far. When I was a child, um, bees were a huge part of my life. My grandparents owned a store here in Sacramento called Sacramento Beaky Bean Supplies. Has anybody ever been there before? It's downtown. Cool, a couple of you. Um, 
They specialize in selling beekeeping equipment, honey, and candle wax, you know, for making candles. Um, I would help my grandfather out in the bee yards all over Sacramento. He had bees in certain places. He had some here in West Sacramento. He had some in Clarksburg. And I would go out, and I learned how to take care of bees. I learned apiculture. And when I was younger, everything was going fine. My grandpa was making honey, putting it into the store, selling it. As I got older, to be about your guys' age, about 12, 13 years old, I started noticing, man, my grandfather's hives aren't doing so hot anymore. Something's happening. He's ha each, all of his hives, he's got over half of them are dying off every year. Is it something that he was doing wrong? Couldn't be something he was doing wrong. He was like the best. He took such good care of those bees. It's almost an everyday thing. So what else was happening? Was somebody poisoning our bees? No, we started talking to more beekeepers and finding out it was happening all over the place. So what was going on? It was something beyond my grandfather and I's control. What was happening was called colony collapse disorder. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Bees are very complex creatures. They live in a colony centered by a queen bee. That queen is usually the mother of all of the bees in that hive. And they work for a common goal, which is collecting honey, feeding the colony, raising young, and giving life to the next generation. They feed on nectar and pollen from flowers, which they use for protein and for sugars. The ancient Egyptians domesticated the honeybee around 4,500 years ago. They're the only domesticated insect on the planet. We need honeybees for the wax that they make us, for honey that they make us. Who in here likes honey? Right? We all like honey in here, most of us. Some of us are like, too sweet, you. but I love honey. But more importantly, we need them for pollination. Pollination is a very important process that bees do. Um, one third of the food we eat comes from bees. It's pollinated by bees. We all have fruits and vegetables that we love in here, and then we all have other things that are made from those fruits and vegetables that we also enjoy. Without bees, we're not eating those. So, the bees are dying. Let's get back to colony collapse disorder. It's also called CCD. Um, it's a major factor in their decline. There's some other things that are happening that are making the bee populations go down, but it's mainly colony collapse disorder. Colony collapse disorder, I'll tell you guys how it kind of goes down. Um, basically, the bees start taking off in huge waves. So one day you'll get about, you know, a fourth of the hive will take off. Then half the hive will take off, and then you have the queen left with a bunch of workers. So the hive basically disappears. Um, they've done studies, they track them out to certain places where they fly. It's ultimately really unknown the pattern of how it goes. Um, when the queen is left with her few young workers around her, they usually die due to weather, predation, or other factors that happens in a very small honeybee colony. Um, we're noticing all over the world, um, I think it's greater than 50% of hives are dying. So it's pretty dire right now because we need these bees so much in our lives. Next slide. Come on. There we go, guys. So what can be done? I'm going to give you guys a couple little things you can do to help the bee population around here in Sacramento. Does anybody own bees in here? Does anybody have a beehive? Not one of you. Okay, one dude. Awesome, man. You rock. Oh, a couple more in the back. Sweet. So, if you don't own a hive, try it. It's awesome. It's really rewarding. Some of you may be saying, oh, I don't want to get stung. I don't want to do that. My parents would not fly having a beehive in the backyard. How many people's parents here would not fly having a beehive in the backyard? Yeah, I figured. Well, if you can't have bees in your backyard, there's some other things that you guys can do. The first thing you can do is you can help by eliminating harmful pesticides used in gardens or lawns. Um, there are other ways that you guys can have natural pest prevention. One animal that causes havoc in gardens um, is the aphid. Um, aphids are these little green insects that basically suck the life out of a lot of plants that we know and love, especially roses. They really like roses. So something that we can do is we can go buy some ladybugs at a local flower shop and release them into your backyard. The way that aphids suck down flowers is basically the way that ladybugs suck down aphids. They'll eat a ton of them. So that's one natural way. Um, the bees can still collect from flowers, and they're not going to bring any harmful chemicals or pesticides back to the hive if you have ladybugs instead of pesticides. Um, the other thing you can do is you can provide a honeybee habitat. Honeybees love a lot of different types of flowers. Do your research. Uh, two I can give you off the top of my head, clover 
a really, really good one you can use. And lavender is a really, really good one you can use. Bees absolutely love those two plants. Um, also, give them a water source. Uh, you can, if you have a bird bath, does anybody have a bird bath in here? I know they're kind of, yeah, okay, a few of you. You guys can put rocks and sticks half in the water, half out of the water, and the bees can actually use those land on them and get water from the rocks and sticks. So right on the base, they can go down, drink water, bring it back to the hive. If you don't have a bird bath, you guys can use a bucket, stick some sticks in it, or any kind of old plate or bowl that you have lying around. Um, the last thing you guys can do to help the local bee population around here is you can buy local honey from local beekeepers. Farmers markets are a big place where you can find local beekeepers. They can usually tell you where the honey's coming from and how they got it. And most of the time, I know there's some people out there, but most of the time, these local beekeepers are practicing sustainable practices. They're doing the right thing, taking care of their bees the right way. When you go to big supermarkets or big department stores that have honey, um, you really got to do your research on the honey you're buying. Uh, look at the back, uh, see where it's coming from. Because most of the time, it may be coming from out of state, and even worse, it may be coming from out of the country. And they're from big commercial producers of honey. Uh, finally, guys, I just want to say thank you for having me today. Um, knowing that there's a problem is half the battle, and I hopefully you can implement some of these little tips I gave you today to help these insects in the future. Thank you.